Hello and welcome on Tafaragadamu. Again, this country is in transition. And in times like this, a big question becomes, how about the rule of law? And where is the process of change headed? I'll be joined by legal scholars from the Addis Ababa University, Dr. Abarra Adagafa and Mulgeta Argawi. A very warm welcome to the program. We live in interesting times. That could be uh, a blessing. It could also mean uh, a curse. I'd like to look into your perceptions of what goes on in this country. Of course, it's an interesting time. And, uh, but if we generally look at it, uh, the situation we are in is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it combines both hopes and challenges. So it remains to be seen where, uh, whether we are going to transit to democratic society system or or maybe have uh, a kind of con in transition that's going to be another transition kind of perpetual transition which has been the case in ethiopia mm -hmm. so it's uncertain as to where we are heading do you share that uh, yes i do generally speaking uh, the country has been you know demanding for change and uh, we are going we are we are getting what we want to change in general. As to how the, the, the change looks like, well, it, it looks like, you know, gray. We have hopes and uh, like uh, Dr. Avara said, we have also questions that need to be answered. So I would say, yes, we're, we're living in very interesting times. We have seen things that have never been seen in this country for years. Oh, yes. Okay, the hopes on one side, okay, we can leave them at that. But let's talk about let's talk about the challenges. What are the challenges you can you can think of as uh, we move forward in this country? Yeah, the challenge uh, starts with the very uh, nature of uh, the transition. Who, who is leading the transition, and uh, what kind of transition are we uh, going to have in Ethiopia? Because uh, Transition of this type usually comes so either top down or bottom up, or sometimes it may be negotiated. But if you look at the kind of transition in Ethiopia, uh, there was a mass protest, a revolt against the system. So uh, the, the new administration has come in by of, uh, maybe, I don't know, kind of saving the system because it is EPRDF itself. A reformist group within EPRDF has, uh, you know, come as a leader of the, the, the reform or the transition. Now the issue is, how can this reformist group within EPRDF uh, lead the transition? Because the anti-reformists are also within the transition, the, within the, the EPRDF itself. There's a kind of uh, difficulty that the, the new administration is, uh, is facing. Because if you look at institutional and structurally, the anti-reforms are more, uh, you know, they have embedded institutional uh, foundation than the reforms group. The reforms are only elements. So how can this, uh, unless the, the, the reforms group f fully sides with the people? So in one way you want to save the system, the EPRDF. In one way you want to also lead the transition. So that, that itself creates challenge to, the, to, the, to the, this group who is uh, leading the, the reform or the transition. So as a result of uh, this, I think Ethiopia is facing today, you know, a problem is that could be expressed by way of, say, absence of adequate security. People don't feel very secure or very safe anymore because we have conflicts of different kinds. So law and order, which is the most important function of the state, is facing its own challenges when we talk of the country in terms of concretes. So that is the first fundamental problem that needs to be taken care of. So the government, you know, you don't see the government being in charge of the country in terms of those in terms of managing and stopping those conflicts then like dr Abara said 
then once we secure the security of the country, we would be able in a position to move on forward and, you know, get together and discuss as to what we could do. So I would say law and order should be given priority today. Then, mm, you know, we need to stop the killings, the, the, the dislocation is in, in hundreds of thousands in this country. So I would say that is the most pressing problem facing Ethiopia today, both so, uh, as a government and as people. So, what does it mean? I, mean, I just, I just want, I just want you to reflect on what you just, you just got mentioned, law and order a little bit more. Uh, is that are we in some kind of constitutional crisis as we speak today? I mean, actually, uh, crisis has been there when, when the, the old regime or the EPRDF failed to comply. What, with what the constitution provides from the very outset, that itself had created a crisis already. Because you have a constitution, and that constitution has not been operating, uh, doing well. The exercise of power is, is done outside the constitutional framework. So the constitution was in place only in name, in writing. So that itself creates... You mean cover to cover? The yes. constitution was not implemented? No, the, the regime wanted to... Applied when, when it needed some provisions uh, for uh, itself and against others when, when it switched to apply them selectively. Now, coming to the current situation, if this regime uh, can really go and uh, bring on board all the opposition fully, okay, made participatory the whole process that may be helpful but if the regime he tries to proceed with a kind of control transition that may put us in danger so the, the approach where uh, now seems to be uh, that the the regime the reforms group is kind of uh, you know the approach is kind of control transition it, it, it doesn't want to lose some of its powers okay its position power position and that way, you cannot really uh, take us out of the, the, the current crisis. So I, I see that as a problem. Do you, do you see that as a problem? Because I see, I see many in the opposition who have moved into to Ethiopia. They have been granted some kind of amnesty. I mean, they are not, no longer labeled as terrorist organizations, including those from Eritrea and so on, who have been, who've been operating out, 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 out of Eritrea and so on and so forth. So it looks like everybody has come aboard. No, does that does that make sense, for, for you, Dr. Abara? In which case, they are free to operate. Yes, but uh, it's more than that. It has to be institutionalized. You have to look at the the, mm. uh, the electoral board, the judiciary, other institutional, uh, you know, foundations, which helps us to transit to democratic order. The, the, that groundwork has not been done. It is not being done. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying uh, nothing has been done but it's not fully being done. So there are still fears that they may not do well the groundwork for to transit to democratic order. That's what all I am saying. Other than that, uh, I, I accept that there, the, there is opening of uh, political space and they are here that that's, gives us hope. Do you think this is a controlled transition? Mm, is it? Or do you have a, any other definition for what goes well, on? Uh, first of all, I'd like to remind everybody that the government has gone on record declaring that the constitution has never been operational. That was a uh, appraisal by the APRDF authorities themselves. Actually, the vice uh, uh, prime minister uh, at the uh, uh, you know, went public with that kind of declaration. The constitution has never been operational. So, to talk of, in terms of uh, constitutional uh, Rule or in terms of the language of rule of law would simply be inadequate, even in the eyes of the Ethiopian government itself. So going forward, how do we do? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the APRDF was forced to change by protesters that came from the people, from almost every corner of the country. The question is, who is managing those protesters? I mean, the change that came as a result of the challenge that came from the people is the APRDF itself. 
so the creator of the problem is trying to manage the problem. So is it within the power of the EPRDF to bring about the kind of change that the country is looking for? Remain this, remain this, you know, to be seen. But like you said, there are some promising, you know, takeoffs, like, uh, you know, inviting those opposition parties. And now I think uh, political, uh, opposition political parties have the ability and the right to, to go around and, you know, address people and organize themselves as viable political parties, which was not uh, possible in the last 27 years. So generally speaking, the problem that we're facing today is not a problem that was brought by Dr. Abi. It is a problem that has been, you know, evolving for the last 27 years. That's why we are living now in a state of confusion. Nobody seems to know how to proceed from here. Nobody seems to have a roadmap as to how we could, you know, process all these conflicts in terms of political opinions, those divergences, differences. So you see, what we need to do, like I said, is firstly secure peace. But simultaneously, we can also, we can also, particularly the, the EPRDF government, can also go ahead and, like Dr. Avara said, try to do work of institutionalizing some of the institutions that have been there. For instance, take the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Now we are arresting people, you know, on account of corruption and, you know, violation of human rights. Do we have quarters who really can handle those cases? If we have to proceed the way we have been proceeding, then we could probably be in the same problem that we have been for the last 27 years. So, you know, there is a lot of work to be done. So we, that I think the government needs to move faster than it's doing now because I don't see that. The other thing is members of the APRDF, the four organizations are, in my opinion, not in a position to communicate with, uh, with each other. They're not communicating. Actually, nowadays we are even witnessing, you know, a very clear, open, public conflict among those organizations. You know, that doesn't send you, you know, comfort. It's very disconcerting. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, there are areas that are blocked, that, that even are not accessible because of protests and, you know, violences. So I need, I think everybody, in terms of, when I say everybody, politicians of all, you know, kinds need to come to their senses and, you know, settle together, talk together, and try to come up to, to come up with a consensus as to how to proceed for what. What you're saying is, yeah. if there is no peace and security, there will be never, there will never be any peace of law. I mean, rule of law. It, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, that's, that's it doesn't. True. I mean, it depends on the level of violence that we are witnessing. No. If he cannot travel from place to place, like safely and freely, if he cannot communicate with your people then how could you talk in terms of law and order? I don't mean that it's completely, you know, one first and the other second. But you need to prioritize. You need to, you know, come up with this roadmap that tells you, you know, we would give priority to this one or more emphasis to this kind of problem because this is more pressing. That is understandable, I would say. But that does not mean there are no things that we can do simultaneously. We can't depending on the resource that the government has its under its disposal. You know, but things are, look dispersed, fragmented today. Because of that, I think we need to first settle down and consider the problem of, you know, peace uh, more than, you know, the other. The other could, could probably give us more time. Do, do, you, do you agree, Dr. Havara? Uh, my, my, my problem, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. Problem is still with with EPRDF itself, the nature of EPRDF. The problem he has raised earlier is, <clears throat> first of all, if the EPRDF is leading the transition, they have to be agree. Okay, the members have to agree, but the question is, the members are having problem among the four between the four. Not only that, within each. Uh, party that has created front, there are anti-reforms group. They have entrenched uh, themselves into the structure up to the Kabali level. Now, 
these guys are capable of sabotaging whatever whatever the the, the reforms group is doing so unless they they come up with some kind of agreement amongst themselves one not only that there are also other opposition groups who are you know no you we don't have national uh, consensus on certain issues so they also have to uh, come to you know certain degree of understanding of our our situation the situation we are in that we really need transition to democracy so they themselves may possibly make use of this and sabotage whatever reform we are attempting to you know uh, carry on so this complication has to be understood so the the, the new uh, ab group they have to first of all try to create some kind of uh, agreement among themselves one that's very important and secondly as to how they can bring on board others so that they may not sabotage whatever attempt is being done to to transit to democracy these are important things mm. well, but, but what constitutes a sabotage in this case can divergent like, divergent opinions within the ruling party be considered as opinions that are sabotaging the whole process of reform for example if if uh, we go down to a certain zone a certain kabali level when the people are in need of action on the part of the government there are groups okay uh, let's say thieves and or some groups uh, whatever they are they are going to take property of others and people come to you to seek assistance your inaction okay is sabotaging people want law and order okay security so if a certain group okay fails to act when there is a need to act that is sabotage in my view so that's what is happening in, in, in many parts of ethiopia so the anti reforms group within uh, every party they are sabotaging so they, they are contributing towards uh, the breakdown of law and order so they themselves are creating problem so in order to uh, come uh, bring this under control the reforms group needs strong partnership with the people okay as well as with some of the opposition we are sincerely want a democratic transition and first of all they they have to make their own house in order which is not in order in my view you you have mentioned both of you institution building i mean talking about the judiciary and all the other arms uh, is the judiciary functional uh, in your opinion in this country or uh, is a total disaster uh it's not functioning as much as we would have liked it to be functioning because for the last 27 years again by the admission of the government itself the, the judiciary has first not been independent actually it has been corrupt i mean this is what all the words tell you in the street you can you know even judges themselves attest to this fact so and there are researches that show that the judiciary has never been independent the judiciary as well has never been in a competent actually it was abdicating even the constitutional you know power that was provided for in the constitution to the judiciary so we don't have competent judiciary in ethiopia so this is a problem that has been accumulating there for years for decades okay so i don't expect it to be overcome by a year or two or three years effort we will have you know we need a lot of work to overcome those those challenges so the system that the aprdf has put in place does not allow the aprdf itself to seek help but the, the fact that the judiciary would, you you said the, by even by the by the admission of the the current the ruling party and also by by accession the government the, the judiciary you said was not independent right but then does that that necessarily translate to mean uh, that the, there was no judiciary at all it was functioning it's not like there was a total failure on that front correct that's why i said it was not as effective as efficient as independent as we wanted it to be so does that does that point in part to the legal education in other words to you guys at the end of the day no i would say it's, 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 it's government needs to take responsibility for that it was the aprd who destroyed the judiciary as far as i'm concerned because you know a judiciary is not independent simply means that it's dependent on the government it's because the government does not want it to be independent that it is not independent it's not and the other thing is when we come to legal education who controls the schools 
the control is the curriculum of those universities. I mean, Ethiopian universities are completely controlled by Ethiopian security. But 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 what are you politicized? But what were you teaching them in those in those situations? Well, that is a bit contentious, by the way. It's not. It's, it's, I mean, there are different opinions Absolutely. to the whole. Do you know what? Uh, let, let me go to the issue of judicial independence, independence of judiciary. Now, one has to look at the, the, the broader picture of how the, the judiciary relates with the parliament. Now, how does the independence of judiciary affected by the, the, the nature of parliament you have in the parliamentary system? Now, the judiciary, first let's take the, 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 the Supreme Court, the leaders, president, the vice president, okay? These are submitted to the parliament, members of parliament, by the prime minister. Now, if the parliament is dominated by one party, there is no way of checking whether those who are going to be presented to the parliament to be appointed are competent legally, loyal to the constitution and maybe uh, impartial. So in view of the fact that the house is dominated by those and uh, whatever the prime minister who is a leader of the ruling party submits is going to be appointed, you cannot expect the jury to be independent. Not only that, the issue of corruption. An official may be corrupt and brought before this uh, judge. So this judge cannot decide, okay, give impartial decision when it comes to the the prosecutor and the government being you know party to, 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 to the conflict to the dispute and it's difficult for this judge who have been picked by the party to decide anything against the, this individual corrupt individual that was how this series of corruptions these people have escaped they have been there untouched that's how the whole system Okay, constitutional system is going to be in danger. If your judiciary is not functioning, the entire constitutional setup is going to be in danger in but many what, countries. But what would your role be as legal educator, okay. I mean, legal scholars, as as professors in the university? And there are several in all the universities across the country. Yeah, I mean, would there be? Could you, would you be able to bring some change beyond uh, teaching law? Or is there any other outlet that needs to be employed to, to be able to, yeah. you know, I mean, people need to know uh, things yeah. about the rule of uh, law and uh, not only the practitioners. As individuals, you can do certain things as a, as a lawyer. Of course, when it comes to education, legal education, basically what our students have been taught has been there. Independence of judiciary. When is a uh, judiciary independent? When it's not? How to, they should be appointed? All these are clear in any democratic society. How judiciary when and how the judiciary becomes independent is clear. There is no problem with legal education. No education in class. Now, when it comes to individuals after graduation, now it needs courage. Uh, I have to be fair here. If you are really a judge committed to the law, as you've been taught in class, you can boldly take a measure, dissent, and finally be fired. In that sense, we are not seeing many uh, graduates doing this. Maybe the only example is uh, Bertukar. <laughs> yeah. So if such people, okay, a number of people emerge, they may possibly change, okay, check try to, you know, do something against the system. But our graduates, somehow they are going to be, you know, engulfed by the, the, the already uh, corrupt groups, those who are hand in glove with the executive. So they've been joining the system and benefiting. So, I, so I'm so i not suggesting that uh, uh, we could not have done more than this. We could have done a lot as individuals. So individual commitments as lawyers, okay, being really committed, loyal to the law, that that problem still exists. As as, as an individual, as an individual yes. lawyer, yeah. I'm not do. If I were to join the judiciary, I'm not going to be ordered to do anything. Rather, it's better for me to just be in the academia than doing whatever somebody tells me. Because my profession 
doesn't tell me that. Our universities are simply a reflection of our society. They can't be that radically different from what we have in the country as a whole. The other thing is the Ethiopian government, the APRDF, for the last 27 years has been watching the universities as its private property. You know, there was no, as far as I'm concerned, there was no academic freedom in the universities in the sense that even students were not allowed to feel free in classrooms. Uh, I've been teaching in this university since 2010, and I always ask my students to, you know, participate in class discussions, and what you see is when you ask them, you know, when you make them comfortable as e enough to, to express themselves, what they tell you is they're simply afraid. You'd ask them, why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? They would say they are afraid of the government. They cannot discuss the government for heaven's sake in a law school. You cannot discuss whether or not the constitution is operational in class. You cannot discuss the limitations of the constitution for fear of, because... You know, there are some students who are planted by the government to spy on, you know, the uh, professors and, and the students themselves. Is that true? Yes, that's very true. The students tell you that. Hmm. That they have been assigned to, yeah. The students that's themselves true. tell you that they have been assigned yes. to spy on the professors, Absolutely. on you? you? You get that information from straight from those from spies? Students, from students, yes. You know, when they leave school, if you remain, you know, friendly to them, they just tell you what was happening in the school. Actually, there were professors who were challenged by security guys. Persons I know. For what they said in a classroom, in a law school. So it was the campus is engulfed by the umbra of fear. Even professors, many professors are not, I don't feel like free to express themselves, you know, to the extent their academic performance requires. Can you now? Well, if you're talking about me, that's a different thing. I mean, I, but I mean I'm just, has this, has, 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 do you yeah, see people are opening changing? up? Okay. Yeah, it is opening up. That, that, that's one of the hopes that, that we are entertaining today. Yes, academic freedom. You know, academic freedom is not about only about writing and talking. Freedom primarily should start how you feel in that environment. If you don't feel like you can think freely, you can write freely within that campus environment, then you cannot speak in terms of academic freedom. Uh, professors are there to teach and uh, different perspectives, okay? Not only one perspective. But uh, we, the practice was uh, to not to tolerate any critical mind. So the professors, if they tend to be critical, and maybe for a different perspective than the dominant ones, they are always leveled. So this has been the case. That's why the students uh, have not really been fully participatory in, in, in asking questions, in really uh, gaining from whatever the, the whole exercise in class. So that may possibly affect uh, the students, even in their, in their uh, future career as, as lawyers. So it's part of the culture that has been embedded in the, over the last, uh, how many years, 20-something years. In fact, uh, during the dark period. So that is still there. It was a pleasure having you on my show. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.